Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of Prime Talk. Today I have a special guest. Today I'm having Dave Bunch. Dave is the president of Grove, which is a brand aggregator of wellness and beauty brands with an e-commerce focus. So Dave, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate you having me. Our pleasure, really. Um, so, all right. So today's episode is going to be the story of David Bunch. You're going to share with us who are you, where are you from, where were you born, where did you grow up, how did you begin your professional career, all the way to where you are in e-commerce today. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So um, hopefully this is interesting to, to all of you. But yeah, I grew up in uh, Utah uh, in, a, in a little town uh, close to the Idaho border in Logan and spent all of my youth there. Um, before I really uh, began the, uh, the college and university studies, I went on a church mission uh, for, for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon Church, as many know. I uh, spent two years so, in... So let's, let's backtrack a little. So mm -hmm. you grew up in Logan, you say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Utah, and you grew up in, a, I guess, a Mormon family? I did, yep. So, so let's touch that for a minute. I want to touch the childhood, if, if, if I may. Okay. So your, your parents, what were their profession? Were they in the, the, the spiritual uh, industry? or? No, no, not at all. So my, my father's a, a college professor in, in animal science, and uh, my mom uh, was in elementary education. Uh, she mostly spent uh, her, her working career at home with us. Um, but she, you know, she was educated and, and uh, had that elementary education background. You guys are a large family, a small family? Uh, so yeah, there, there was four of us, uh, which is about the average uh, family size uh, in Utah, it is four. Um, but a lot of my friends had, you know, seven, eight, um, you know, I had some that had over 10, 10 wow. kids. So nice. yeah, they're very family oriented, uh, the community I lived in, in, in Utah in particular. Nice, nice. And growing up, were you involved in anything that I was an uh, entrepreneur in, in spirit or in nature? Yeah, I mean, just from a, an early age, um, you know, my parents always encouraged us to, to, to have jobs. And, and, and so whether it was a paper out or, or, or selling things, um, you know, we were always kind of thinking, you know, how can we make money? Um, was that because of financial reasons or more like educational, like uh, you got to own yourself reasons or? Yeah, um, both? a combination. I mean, my parents did did well and, and, and supported us well, um, but, you know, they encouraged us to work hard. I mean, my father, he, he grew up in a, uh, a family where he was the first high school graduate and, um, you know, came from a family that uh, didn't have a lot of financial means. And so for my father, it was all about you know, working hard and, and, and taking care of yourself. And so, you know, from a young age, um, you know, I, I remember I was six years old when I, I started my first paper out. Uh, really? You know, six years old? Wow. Going door That's to pretty door solid. Delivering papers. And, and, and so from there... Did you read the papers back when you were six years old? Uh, maybe a little. It was more about, uh, yeah, uh, ma making some money. And so that's... Wow. And it's hard to, when you're six... You know that that was one of the only options you know I had at the time, um, but yeah, all of all of my siblings were were very much that way. Um, we all um, you know worked hard at, at a young age uh, to really, and 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 they encouraged us to do so. Um, you know to explore different things, and and uh, so I think that's really where it started. That's great. I love that. Okay, so let's touch. So you finished high school, and after high school, you went on a mission, or uh, yeah, so, yeah, what was so the trajectory? Uh, I went on a church mission. So how it works is uh, you you turn in your uh, your papers to the church, and then they assign you to an area to go, and 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 generally for two years. Hold on, when you say turn in your papers, what kind of papers are we talking about? Just uh, I'm not familiar. It's almost, it's almost like an application saying yes, I want to serve a mission, and um, almost like soldier style. Oh, it sounds like army because you know when I, I was a civilian back in Israel and I drafted to the army. There was a whole kind of chain of events that happened to that happened and all, all of a sudden I'm a soldier. I'm a, a property of this big organization called the Israeli IDF or Israeli Defense Force. Was that kind of the, the dynamic or or just you applying application to, to enter a mission? Yeah, and it, it, it's more, it, it's it's voluntary, so it's not required by the church. I, I would say in, encouraged, um, but, uh, uh, you know, you go when you're 18 or 19 years old and you turn in your, in your paper, so like an application saying, yes, I want to go. It's, it's something that you you actually pay your own way. Uh, so it's something, if you're gonna go and do that, you gotta really believe in, in kind of what you're doing. 
And uh, so I turned in my papers when I was 18. Um, I got called to uh, Uruguay, Uruguay in, in uh, South America. Wow. And uh, I spent uh, a little over two years there um, living with the people, uh, you know, serving them. Montevideo? And, yeah. So I spent about a year in Montevideo, but I also spent time in, in what they call the interior of the country and, and a lot of the smaller cities. Uh, still have a lot of good friends there. Um, I think for me, going there really gave me a perspective on, on you know, what I have in, in the U.S., um, you know, versus, you, you know, seeing, you know, uh, other people in their circumstances. And If where, I may, can you take us a little bit to the world of Uruguay? What did you experience? What did you learn about it? Uh, take us there for a moment, because I've been yeah. there, but just for a short few days, two years is a uh, is much more, you know, uh, I guess advanced, uh, I would say, or more in depth. So take us there for a moment because I'm curious. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So it's just, uh, it's just south of Brazil. So I remember getting there my first day and you get off the plane and, and I thought I knew Spanish because uh, <laughs> you go to, when you do missions, they send you a training center for two months and you learn, you learn more about, uh, you know, church topics, but also uh, the language. And so I thought I knew a little bit when I got off the plane and I heard people speaking I couldn't really even, uh, I couldn't really understand anything. And so I knew that, that uh, this is going to be a little bit harder than I thought. And it, and it took a few months to, to really uh, pick up the Spanish language, but it did come eventually. And, and by the end, I spoke very fluently. But I, my first area I served, and it was right up on the border with Brazil on the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, my first my first house, uh, you know, the toilet was just a hole. Um, my <laughs> The shower was, uh, they'd heat the water through this electrical device. So if you, if you reach your hand up uh, close to the shower head, it would uh, shock you. And so I remember just, those. I remember those. Yeah. South America, they're very uh, ubiquitous. Yeah. So very, very different. Uh, you know, there wasn't uh, central air. Uh, you know, there wasn't air conditioning. There wasn't central heating. Um, but it was interesting. The people there, um, you know, very kind and, and, and friendly. Um, you know, they welcomed us into their homes. Uh, we would eat most meals uh, with people, whether they were members of the church or, or just, uh, you know, people that became friends of ours. And uh, so let me understand this. So wherever you stayed in, around Uruguay, there were churches, community of churches, uh, Mormon ones, and you go there and you interact with the community. What do you do day to day? What's your purpose? What's your mission there? Yeah. Yep. So there was a, wherever we were at, there was a, a Mormon church. Um, so we would spend our days working with, with members uh, that were already members of the church. We also taught people that were interested in the church. Uh, so they may be, you know, what we called as investigators. They wanted to learn more. Um, we also spent a lot of time doing service. So we would teach uh, English classes um, you know, we would, we would help in the community, whether we're volunteering, uh, at, you know, food kitchens or just people in the neighborhood that, that needed our help. Uh, we'd spend a lot of time serving. So really it was, uh, you know, a chance for two years to, to really focus on, on others kind of outside of myself, you know, just the first 18 years, you're very much focused on yourself in high school and, you know, sports and, you know, dating and all of that. And it's really kind of self-focused. This was a chance to really you know, spend time thinking about others. And, uh, you know, so it was a good, it gave me a lot of perspective um, about life. I think it, it helped me, you know, prioritize, uh, you know, things, uh, you know, better than, than before I left. So you um, would say, definitely say that after two years, it was very impactful for, to shape you up, your, your, your abilities, your mindset, your priorities, your values. Uh, absolutely. How to perform on a mission for two years. It's not like two minutes or two days or two weeks or two months. It's two years. That's very purposeful. Very, very purposeful. So uh, I, I salute you for that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So it's something I, you know, I think about almost every day, uh, just, just, uh, you know, bits and pieces. And, and fortunately through social media, um, you know, there's several people that I still interact with and have become kind of long, uh, you know, lifelong friends. And, and what uh, years were you there, if I may? So let's put, uh, let's put some uh, dates into uh, the, the, yeah. the time progression. So what, what, what was the year you started there and what was the year you finished? Yeah, so I started in January of 1995, and I came back in March of uh, 1997. Got it. Uh, Mid 90s, very good. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, let's move then to the next station. After two years in Uruguay, you served the mission, really good. What was the next station for you? Yeah, University? so you get you get back from being a missionary, and uh, it takes it takes a few weeks to adjust because you're on this full time schedule of uh, being a missionary, and then you're back in, in into the real world. 
Uh, so back at home with the parents, uh, it's when I really started uh, uh, my college studies. I went to Utah State University uh, is where I did my undergraduate uh, degree. Um, I initially was going to do medicine. My brother's a cardiologist. Um, I wanted to kind of pursue that path. My grandpa's a, a doctor and, and some of my uncles. Um, but I quickly, uh, and, and this probably goes your back Your grandfather's to, a doctor from your mother's side because you mentioned your father was the first to graduate high school, right? That's right. Yep. From my mother's side. Yep. Okay. Um, that's a good point. Yeah. So from my mother's side, so very, uh, you know, you know, lots on, on, on the medical profession. Um, but I got in, I, I did well in, in, in the classes uh, for pre-med, but I think kind of going back to the paper out, just some of my, uh, you know, starting uh, small entrepreneurial businesses, just that business mindset. So I decided to make uh, the switch and uh, I went into finance and, and accounting. Um, I felt like whatever business I got into, I needed to have a clear understanding of, you know, financials. Um, you know, I felt like it didn't matter what I do. That, that was the most important. So I decided in terms of business that I wanted to focus my effort there. And so I got a degree in, in, in finance uh, from Utah State, uh, minor in economics. And um, <clears throat> so- Utah I, State I, is based in what, Salt Lake City? Uh, Utah State's based in Logan. So, so it's, it's about- close to home, yeah, for you. Yeah, that, was, that was home, that's where I grew up. And uh, so I did my undergrad there. I, I lived with my parents for the first year, and then uh, I got married uh, a year into my, my studies. So I got married pretty early at 22. Nice. Did you meet your wife at the university or from the community? Yeah, so she actually was from the community too. We went to the same high school. Um, I, I knew who she was, but I didn't know her and, until I was in college and we met uh, through some mutual friends. Um, we dated for about a year, and uh, then we got married in 1998. And, uh, you know, this year we'll be uh, married 23 years. And uh, nice. so. Very yeah. good. So university, married, you graduate what year? I graduated in 99. So um, I went through pretty quick. It took me about two and a half years. Uh, went, went summers and, and kind of uh, accelerated. I think being married to, um, you know, I was more focused on, on life. Um, you know, my wife and I making sure, you know, I got through quickly. And so I didn't spend a, a ton of time in school. Um, so I finished in 99, uh, had, had a lot of uh, job opportunities. Um, I ended up going to a company called uh, Nutraceutical is where I started my career. And Nutraceutical is an aggregator. Um, at the time, you know, Nutraceutical was focused on the health food and specialty channel. And uh, that was primarily these mom and pop health food stores. And, and back in 1990. Nine, there were thousands of these stores and there's been some consolidation, you know, now Whole Foods and Sprouts and some larger retailers, you know, dominate more uh, that channel. But at the time there were lots of independent health food stores and there still are some today. But if you look at the, the market share in that channel, there's lots and lots of brands and none of those brands really represent a lot of market share. And so Nutraceutical felt like there was an opportunity in that channel to do some consolidation. And so I joined uh, on the accounting and finance side and, and quickly, uh, you know, got involved in their m and And, uh, you know, towards the end, well, towards the last 10 plus years of my career there, I was actually there for 21 years. I oversaw- 21 years from 1999 until 2020? That's right, yeah. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to unpack this a little bit. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, long so time. Just give, one, just give me one, but I just wanna bring some context into the mix. So late 90s, 1999, it wasn't as advanced or as, the awareness of consumers wasn't as strong as it is today. You know, we're in year 2021. Today, you know, supplements, well, wellness and beauty is, 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 is a really uh, high, on high awareness, at least in the United States and in, in the Western world. People are really attentive to that, to, you know, preserve your body, enhance it, make sure you, you reach longevity. Uh, much more than the 90s. It was, I, I want to say early beginnings, but it was just getting momentum in the late 90s. And you, that's when you kind of went into the mix and you were saying because it was kind of uh, scattered all over, you know, you were uh, with the company that kind of saw the landscape and said, let's start consolidating it and create more traction, more bodies, more movement, something that's more cohesive and it's a powerhouse or a juggernaut in the industry. So take us from 1999 to, uh, I guess, your, your progression in the company. What was your first position? What was the next position inside the company? Uh, to give us an understanding of your your evolution within the industry. 
Yeah, sure. Yeah, and that that that's a great uh, explanation of kind of the, the the landscape at the time, and and uh, you know people were going to these health food stores to get their supplements um, because they weren't commonly found elsewhere, um, or at least a wide variety. And you know that's obviously changed. But um, I started out in in actually uh, uh, cost accounting, and uh, so not necessarily something I wanted to do long term. But I liked the company. Um, Nutraceutical at the time was publicly traded. You say, oh, so it was already a public company, right? We were a public company, traded on the NASDAQ, yep, and just had gone public uh, in, in 1998. So, so it's, it's, it is, even though it's a wealth and beauty, I want to, once again, bring some more context. Early, in late 90s or up to year 2000 or 2001 was the dot-com. The NASDAQ was booming. That was like a bubble that was going on. Many startups, fresh companies were going to the NASDAQ and getting amazing valuations until it kind of collapsed. I think it was 80% drop uh, or meltdown throughout the market. But you guys weren't technology per se. We're more on the wealth and you know wellness and beauty. Uh, but uh, you were mentioning, okay, already a public company, freshly minted in the Nasdaq uh, for the most part, and then you come in and you cost accounting. What's that? Yeah. So really, um, kind of managing product costs. Um, you know, we were a manufacturer, and and so all the accounting. You own the factories. We did. Yep. We did okay, almost ninety wow. percent of all of our our manufacturing. Uh, we did in house. And uh, so it was a really an, a very entry level role, um, but I liked the company, I liked the industry, um, you know, the types of products. And I knew that, you know, people <clears throat> were starting to think more about what they put in their body and about their health. And so I liked direction where that was going. Uh, but it was interesting, you know, I started and, and quickly on our, our CEO, and, you know, I credit a lot to him, the founder C CEO, Bill Gay, and that he, you know, people that worked hard, um, he gave opportunity to and probably ahead of, you know, your experience. And so he got me involved early on in a lot of the M&A uh, transactions. The, the first one I was involved on was, you know, less than six months in, uh, in 2000. And at that so time- you pulled I, out of cost accounting and say, I want you to hit this deal, this M&A merging acquisition deal. And that was your first uh, dive into the water? Yeah. So, yep. Yep. So he got me involved there. And I remember I, I was in uh, Fort Lauderdale and we were going to a company and I couldn't even rent a car because it wasn't 25, <laughs> but he gave me the opportunity to go there and, and surrounded me with some, some good people. And uh, that's where I really started to learn, um, you know, more about the industry, about the M&A process. And, uh, you know, from there, um, but take us, know, take us to the first deal. If you may, the numbers, if, if it's, I mean, it's a public company, it shouldn't be a, uh, yeah, and it was a maybe there was press releases involved also. Yeah, and this was a small deal. So it was, a uh, you know, less than a million dollars. We bought it from a company called Rexall and they actually had, had put a pause on the brand. And, uh, so we went in and acquired it. Um, we liked the brand name and uh, so it was a small deal. And, uh, my initial roles were things like, you know, you're counting the inventory with, and, you know, you're, so all the things that they didn't want to do, which were good to do, you know, a lot of the, you're going out to the warehouse and participating in the physical of the inventory and make sure it's done right. You know, the, the what, doing the due diligence or after the purchase? No, before. Yeah. So, so up before, so a lot of the due diligence, so counting inventory, you know, going through bank statements and uh, what we call a proof of cash and, and making sure that, um, you know, the financials are accurate and really tracing it to the, the cash, the ins and the outs. Um, you know, was that a successful deal eventually that they, they, they emerged nicely? Uh, it was pretty good. We, it was the brand, they had, they had stopped the brand. And so we had to restart the brand. Um, and so in, in terms of what we paid for it, uh, you know, for what we got out of it, it was a good deal. Um, okay, we good. Did, yeah. And then the, the thing that we did at Nutraceutical. So it, one of the things that made it nice is we had the infrastructure in place. So when we bought this brand, we didn't actually take any people with it, but we already had people in place in all the functional areas. We had manufacturing, we had a retail sales team. You know, at the time there was very little e-commerce, uh, you know, going on. So it was mostly, you know, brick and mortar stores, but we had regulatory. So we had all these things in place. And so you could automatically, as you bring it in, you know, you realize significant savings just by being part of, of the nutraceutical platform. Nice. Okay, take us to the next station or uh, progression. So you did this MA deal. Take us forward. Let's see a progression in uh you know, Yeah, so what happened is, you know, initially the first few deals I did, I was more, you know, learning process, you know, doing a lot of the due diligence, a lot of the I was in in, in deep in the detail. 
Um, but over time, you know, they got more confidence in me where I actually got involved in, in the negotiation uh, to the structuring of the deals. Um, I was involved a lot in, in sourcing um, as I got to know more and more people in the industry. And then, you know, a lot of times I would actually run the brands for a time before they were integrated in, into the nutraceutical uh, platform. And so I'd have that. Tell me about the nutraceutical uh, during the dot-com uh, bust. Did the stock fell down or did you guys take uh, any financial hits or what was the yeah, spirit of the yeah. times? So when nutraceutical went public in 98, um, you know, early on we, we had missed an initial earnings and we dropped significantly. And, and so, um, you know, the market cap went, went way down, um, you know, and then it was just a gradual uh, climb over time until in uh, 2017, we were acquired by a private equity group. And at that time it sold. Did you guys um, get delisted or we became private no, or you still stayed no. the public? Yeah, we did fine. Um, you know, the, the business did fine. And we were actually able through acquisitions and organic growth, we were able to grow top and bottom line. Um, when, when the company in 2017 was acquired by a private equity group, um, we, 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 we sold for about 430 million. Um, at the time we were about 43 million of EBITDA, um, you know, so about a 10 multiple. And, uh, you know, it, um, one of the things that we didn't probably do a great job, you know, is we didn't really uh, get involved on the e-commerce side and, and, and take advantage of where the growth was going. Um, we stayed pretty true to that health food specialty channel, which is, is a great channel to be in, but, but it's, it's really a channel that, that is struggling. Um, mom and pop stores, you know, they're going out of business. A lot of the business uh, the supplement volume is moving online and into bigger retailers into other channels. When did you start noticing that? Uh, now looking back into uh, you know the time horizon, what was the uh, you know we just touched the early two thousands, you know twenty years into the mix. Maybe you want to take us uh, the dynamics you see or the things that shifted uh, in, in the industry. Yeah, so even early in the the early two thousands, we started to see some consolidation even at the retail level. So mom and pops getting acquired, uh, you know, by bigger and and, and becoming part of you know, bigger chains. So there was consolidation there. Um, we started to see some brands move into, you know, more traditional channels um, like grocery and, and mass type of accounts. Yeah. Now you go to Walmart, you go to any, any food store, you'll find a nice robust supplements category instead of like, you know, maybe, maybe 20 plus years ago, there's nothing. It's still yeah. to a lot of presence. That's exactly right. Yeah. So no longer a lot of those consumers, they didn't have to make the, the special trip to the health food store because they could find it in, in traditional retail. Or, or that affected you or you guys expanded into uh, selling to you know the big box stores? It, it did affect us. Um, we, we expanded, but probably not to the degree that we should have. Um, gotcha. And, uh, you know, so in hindsight and, and, and some of that, you know, it um, you know, the, it was differing opinions on what to do um, just internally on, on the management side uh, on really to go after the e-commerce and some of these other channels. The other thing, too, that we had to be cautious at the time is is health food stores were very protective. And so if they saw you take your brands into to other retail channels, they didn't want to carry you anymore because um, they didn't want to compete against a Walmart or a big box. And so it was a balance on how do you kind of migrate out of the health food specialty channel uh, without, you know, hurting your, your existing customer base? And uh, so how'd you, know, you monitor that dynamic? Did you create two lines, one for, you know, brands, a line of brands for the really the specialty stores and a line of brands for, or even do private label. If you guys are really into manufacturing, you just do private label lines for, you know, Walmart or Walgreens or all these, uh, you know, uh, traditional brick and mortar stores. Yeah, so that that's that's really what we did. We we had brands that uh, um, were focused on different channels, and so we kept loyalty to the health food specialty channel with certain brands, and that kind of became our mantra. You know, with these brands, you're not going to find them elsewhere. So health food stores carry these because we, you know we're being loyal to you, and then with other brands, you know, we work those into other channels. And uh, so that, that was really the, the, the pathway that we did that. Um, we probably didn't move as, as fast as we should have or, or you know, I would have liked. Um, and now um, really the, the lines between channels is really blurred with e-commerce. So it's not as big of a deal uh, these days just because you know, with e-com and everyone selling, you know, it's, 
everything's everywhere anyway. So it's hard to keep exclusives, exclusivity into certain channels. But what was the year you started really feeling the impact of uh, online? Because right now you kind of discussed the, 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 the two worlds or two sides of uh, the brick and mortar. You got the specialty stores and the, the big box stores. And when did uh, e-commerce come into the mix and change the dance? Yeah, so I'd say, you know, mid 2000s and, 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 and up uh, is where it, it really, uh, you know, we started to see that. Um, and what and was so, the early sprouts that you saw? Was it through eBay, dot com websites of individual brands or was it all Amazon or altogether? Um, you know, Amazon, but a lot of individual sites um, that are specific to our channel, um, like a Vitacost, which is owned by, now by Kroger. Um, there's a big one called iHerb. Uh, that, uh, you know, does several billion in, in revenue at this point. So there was a lot of those that were picking up all of these brands and offering them, you know, online with, with great delivery times, just like Amazon. Were you able and, to establish a relationship with them and sell them? Well, we, we weren't at the time because our CEO's thought was, again, we need to be exclusive to the health food specialty. We don't want to go online and, and really damage, uh, you know, our relationship. And so we were slower to make the move. Uh, you know, to some of these accounts versus our competition that, that went for it and said, look, we may take a hit in health food specialty, uh, but we'll make up for it and more than make up for it in these other channels and online. So we were probably slow to slow to make the move. And hindsight, they were right because the, the, the e-commerce was the wave of the, of the future and it really became more robust than everybody expected. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a lot of our competitors or, or several of them, uh, you know, did better than us by by making that move move early on. And we did make the move. Um, and, you know, Nutraceutical does is doing better and better uh, from an e-commerce standpoint, as well as uh, in in more traditional retail like uh, mass food and drug. Um, but that's, you know, more recent. And, and so we were we were slow. And so now we're, you know, Nutraceuticals having to, you know, to, to make up uh, uh, you know, and gain market share, you know, and it would have been easier if they would have made the move early on, but there was risk to it. And so, you know, I, I think we took more of the conservative approach and, and nutraceutical, if, if you look at the financial results, you know, over the years, it had steady EBITDA and revenue growth. And, you know, some of that was because we would, we would acquire uh, companies, uh, you know, to help uh, make sure that we had that growth even when there were years where we didn't have organic growth and we were down, we were able to make up for that through, through acquisitions. Um, I, I personally did 50 acquisitions there. Um, so I was involved in 50. Um, you know, I think the company total was about 60. And a lot of these were- Wow, actually you really took the grind. You took the heavy load of m and throughout the years for, for the companies, no joke. Yeah, yeah. And what I was, was your official title and role during the, 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 those positions? Uh, so yeah, yeah, VP of, of m and um, yeah, it was really me and one other person, uh, you know, for a 10 year period where we did, you know, almost all the M&A uh, together. Um, I was adding up, I, I looked at over a thousand uh, companies uh, when I was at Nutraceutical. So it's only 5% conversion from the 100% that uh, came into the, the web for you at least. Yeah, yeah we were a very disciplined buyer um, and, uh, you know, we, we liked to, we, we weren't paying up in, in terms of trying to get things. Uh, we were trying to find things that we felt like we could get, you know, a, a good decent amount of EBITDA and then looking at the synergies of bringing them on at Nutraceutical. So we never really went after kind of the high growing companies that you might have to pay up for. And so we did, we did a lot of looking and, you know, so you look for real value and intrinsic value, you know, along the years, it wasn't just being a hype or paying a premium for something that's really trendy. And it's, it's right. a hype, but you can't really calibrate it properly potentially, and that can have its own risks. Um, would you say that for you, it was, besides being very, you know, on the financial side of mathematical, is, is this like an art form as far as you're concerned, uh, M&As, or what's the art of the deal with this? Yeah, this so, your experience. Yeah, so, you know, we had models and, uh, you know, financial models, and, and we looked at that way, and we looked at a lot of, you know, retail data, you know, to see how the products were performing, you know, on shelf and, and velocity and things. So we looked at a lot of things like that, but at the same time, yeah, a lot of it is an, an art form um, and, and you learn as you go. And, you know, we, we made a lot of mistakes. And so I definitely feel like I'm, I'm much better at what I do now, having gone through a, a thousand companies. And, uh, you know, so as I look at things, it, it's not just about what the financial model tells us, uh, you know, there's more to the story. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's why, you know, 
today, as we look at deals, um, we're looking at things even like, you know, the founder is, is the founder a good fit? Um, can we work well with that person? Um, you know, there's things like that we feel like are just as, as important as it being, you know, making sense from a financial standpoint. Same be beyond the numbers and the money, the humans also take a big place in it. What's the character? What's the value? What's their mission? What's their purpose? How do they, you know, connect to your mission and values and purpose? If there's synergy there or, or lack of synergy and lack of uh, eye to eye, seeing things eye to eye. So you take that into serious consideration? Yep, a absolutely. Yeah, that's that's probably uh, a number one, uh, you know, for us is is the founder and, and, and do we feel like it's a good fit from that standpoint? And then, then we look at the numbers. We also, you know, look at, you know, where do we think, um, you know, so we look at the categories and, and just looking forward, um, is this something that's got staying power? Uh, you know, so there's, you know, is it, a, is it a trend or is this something that's going to be more long-term? And, and so we try to, you know, there's consumer data that we, that we look at, you know, that's more forward thinking and we try to use a lot of that data as well as we, we think about, you know, categories and brands and companies. Gotcha. Okay. So before, cause you know, this was uh, with uh, nutraceutical, but today you're doing, you know, you have your own vehicle with Grove. We're going to touch this very, very soon. Uh, so, cause I want to start packaging uh, the, the nutraceutical story. So out of the 50 deals that you did in 20 plus years, which out of, you know, basically vetting a thousand offers, um, are these 50 deals, what was the success rate? What was the, you know, all of them had a great success in their ROI or was it flops or, to take us a little bit into that. Yeah. Point. So, um, yeah, I would, I would say more, uh, than not, you know, paid for themselves and more, um, we de we definitely had some, some home runs. Um, you know, the, there were a few in there that, uh, you're like, yeah, that was, that was fantastic. And, 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 you know, we failed at a lot too. Um, but we were, we were paying in a range where we could have failures. We weren't, you know, gambling the business. We weren't, you know, we didn't do really do transformative deals where we were kind of betting the ranch and, and, you know, on the company. Um, you know, these are ones that uh, if we missed on them, the company would be okay. So you can absorb the hit, right? So that's to speak. right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Stay in your so, lane. Don't try to over swallow. Yep. Yeah, different, different approach than, uh, you know, a lot of others take and, and we're a little bit different where I'm at today, but that, that was the approach there is kind of slow and steady. Um, just making sure we have growth from a top line and bottom line standpoint. Got it. Very good. Okay. So, you know, after being 20 years, uh, I guess, plus with uh, Nutraceutical, take us to the next station. What led you to that uh, station and what was the genesis of all this? Yeah. So uh, Nutraceutical was acquired by private equity in 2017. In 2019, the private equity group sold 40%. And they actually got a, almost a three times return in less than two years and sold at about a, a $630 million valuation. And uh, at that time, a lot of the management team was leaving, including the, the CEO. Um, this was the second CEO. Um, you know, the, so that's the, not the founder anymore. The founder left in 2017 when the private equity group took over. They brought in a new one. And then this new one uh, was leaving with, with this 40% transaction. Uh, they wanted me to stay, the new CEO wanted me to stay, but I just felt like, you know, I've done that. Um, it's time to do something a little bit more entrepreneurial where it's not so structured. And then I can really implement a lot of the things that I've learned and uh, really wanting to lean heavy on the e-commerce side, um, knowing that that's, um, you know, where the direction of the categories we participate in are going. Um, and Brian Baer, um, who's the founder of the company that I work at now, Grove, he's been trying to get me to, to work for him for, for five or six years. And how'd uh, you guys first meet? I want to hear about the honeymoon and romance of your relationship. We, we actually bought a, a brand of that he worked for at Nutraceutical. And so he worked for us for a short period of time and we became good friends and, and traveled together uh, and did some customer visits. So once again, you bought his company, you had a, maybe a little earnout period or transition period. So you stayed along and, and that's how you established right. your relationship. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And so we, we met there. Um, then he left and, 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 and started this company in 2006 and he would call me and, and, and say this you, company meaning Grove Grove. Yep. But at the okay. time Grove wasn't a, an aggregator. It was an innovation house. He would help uh, brands with their innovation. It grow really morphed into what it is today in the last couple of years. And, um, but yeah, he would, he would call me, uh, you know, are you ready? And, uh, 
I finally called them and said, I am, I'm, I'm ready to go. And uh, so jumped over. Um, we've really kind of changed, changed the company in, in terms of uh, transforming it into, into being an aggregator. And I've spent a lot of my time this last year building out the platform, the services, you know, people. Um, we, we've made over 100 hires. We now have over 400 employees, um, you know, thinking about um, our capital structure, making sure that we're, we're in a place from a capital standpoint that we can actually do, uh, you know, support the growth, both organic and, and, and through acquisitions. So let, let's pause you for a second. So Grove established 2016. Uh, you were still with, um, you know, 2006. Uh, yeah. Oh, 2006. Oh, wow, yeah. that's pretty early yeah. on. Okay. So it's 15 yeah. years into the mix. Uh, and you keep a relationship with Brian for, well, you know, 14 years until you make the move. Uh, and, and in these 14 years, Grove is, is that it transforms itself from an innovation, co innovation company to what, to, explain to us what was the what was it yeah so brian uh ended up buying a couple amazon brands um you know we call them amazon because uh, you know 100, almost 100 percent of the revenue was on born amazon. on amazon born on amazon so to speak yeah, that's right yep so he wanted to get into the branded business you know because at some point he wanted to have something tangible that he could sell beyond you know himself. but as far as uh, i cut you with this so as far as you know what was the year that he bought his first amazon brand uh 2018 Got it. Okay. So what, what was he doing for 20 or 12 years for the most part? Just helping with innovation still? Or? Yeah. So a lot of the large consumer product companies in, in the industry, he was helping them with innovation. How and would he help? Just if you, if you know, like, what, how, yeah, how would he so do that? He, I, mean, I never heard of anything like this. Yeah. So he would go out and he would um, lock up key, uh, you know, raw materials, you know, from an exclusivity standpoint, and then he would go sell them to these different consumer product groups. You know, here's the latest and greatest. He's very good on the things like probiotics. So, you know, he was offering a probiotic, gum, you know, different probiotic gummies to, you know, some of the largest, you know, brands in the market. And we actually still have that component uh, today as part of Grove where, we do some contract manufacturing. Uh, you know, we help other brands uh, with products. That's not the focus, but it's something that we do have, and it cash flows well, and it helps fund you know the rest of the business. So let me understand. Let's see if I got this straight. In the uh, wellness and beauty uh, categories, let's say supplements, right? When you have uh, all these supplements like uh, probiotics, right? It's something that helps your, your digestive system. He was able to. On the on the sourcing side, you know, be able to to source, you know, really high end and exclusive materials and ingredients, and also pitch kind of new products like probiotic gummies. I guess when he was pitching, that was a kind of new and innovative, and that helped other bigger, larger brands become innovative. He was able to uh, put it all together, package it all together, and and basically make earnings from this. It's a unique model I'm not too familiar with, but was that kind of yeah. the dynamic? Yeah, essentially he would go, let's just say to someone that has this probiotic, he would go to them and say, look, I know all the consumer product companies. Let me sell that for you to, to them. Um, give me exclusivity. I will be, you know, I will sell it for you. And uh, he would lock up really good innovation. He's, he's good at seeing kind of where the market is going. And so he's been able to lock up some really good, um, you know, tech, technology or raw materials um, and, and get exclusivity to that. And then, you know, these big companies, you know, Nestle, Nature's Bounty, Pharmavite, you know, they're coming to him because he has exclusivity for them. And that's nice, uh, an interesting so, model. Yep. Yep. So that, that's how he got started. And, and, you know, he was able to cash flow well enough that then he was able to start buying some brands. And what compelled him to buy Amazon brands? Oh, I mean, brands and, and specifically brands that were born on Amazon. Where, where did he come up with that? Handle. Yeah, so I think maybe to a degree in that I started to do that at Nutraceutical. Um, <laughs> he followed the your lead, so to speak. Yeah. Followed the lead a little bit in terms of um, we, we had uh, purchased a couple Amazon only brands, uh, Zao Nutrition. Uh, you know, we, we acquired that in 2017. And then New You Nutrition, which was the largest supplement brand on Amazon in Europe, um, we acquired that in 2019. So he was he was seeing some success that we were doing at Nutraceutical and he's like, there's something here. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, these brands are competing, well, they're out competing the traditional CPG companies. You know, there's something here I need to get involved. And he wanted a brand where he had something tangible to sell. And so he started looking 
uh, at lots and lots of brands. And he ended up buying a couple of brands from Matt Newman who rolled, rolled his, some of his ownership and is actually one of the, uh, you know, the principal owners of, of Grove. So there's Brian Bear and Matt Newman, and that, that's really how it all, it all began. And Matt Newman's re was really his Amazon expertise. So Brian bought, brought this business expertise, and then Matt you know, had the business expertise, but he also had the Amazon as well. And uh, you know, that's really how it got started. So he's able, obviously, to buy a company, but also buy a great uh, talent to come along as a partner, as a, as a core member of, of the whole team. Uh, so it it's, has great values, great purpose and mission and the ability uh, to grow and become shoulders, strong, strong held shoulders on the e-commerce level. Okay, so that all happened in 2018. You came in two years later, 2020. Um, uh, it was kind of a tango dance between they, they you know, they saw your work and your M&A position into the e-commerce, they, they tagged along. So I guess it made per perfect sense to, to put you all together as your dream team, so to speak. Uh, yeah. Okay, so 2020, you get in, take us in the past year, uh, what you guys accomplished so far? Uh, where, where do you guys stand? What makes you guys unique? Um, and so forth. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. So came over in, in, in March of uh, 2020, um, you, you know, just as president and really it, my, you know, my first, you know, tasks were to build out an infrastructure to really support, you know, doing significant, uh, you know, acquisitions. And, and so we, we invested and, and, it was interesting. I left, you know, COVID really hit right as I was leaving. And so even people at Nutraceutical, um, you know, one of the board members had reached out and was like, I'm surprised you haven't come back to ask for your job again. Um, but we were well positioned because um, we were e-commerce primarily and, you know, our business did tremendously, you know, last year. Yeah, it was um, the moment of the big bang. Yeah, exactly. And so, and that really helped fund, uh, you know, building out a team. And uh, so, we build out in, in all functional areas. So we have in-house general counsel. We've got a, you know, a chief operating officer that oversees our manufacturing supply chain. Uh, we manufacture gummies and powders. Uh, we build out a, a traditional retail sales team. So we start on Amazon or our, or our own uh, Shopify accounts, but as we do well, we leverage that and take it into tra traditional retail. Mm -hmm. So just building out all these functional areas and that now is in place. Um, also spent a lot of time thinking about, okay, how do we, we finance this from a capital standpoint? Um, we did bring on uh, one minority equity partner, uh, Palm Beach Capital. And uh, then we, we just finished up a refinance um, of our debt. And uh, through a syndication, we had 10 banks participate. So we've got an additional access to additional 150 million. Um, you know, to really help fund, you know. So this is a credit facility that is committed. So as, as long as you find the deal, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll, fu they'll finance it, correct? That's right. As long as we stay in, in our covenants um, and we, we find deals, um, you know, we, we, we can do these. So we don't have to, there's not necessarily finance contingencies. So as we find deals, um, we're able to execute on close on them quickly. We've done, uh, since I've joined, so, so what, 15, 15 months or so, we've done eight acquisitions. Um, we have three under term sheet. We are, uh, as we close these, these three, we'll be at um, 250 million of revenue and about 45 million of EBITDA. Um, so, you know, we're sizable. It sounds um, a bit uh, double the, the profitability from uh, Nutraceutical. You're saying uh, back in the day, it did about 400 plus and EBITDA was about 10%. It sounds like you guys are doing about 20%. So. There's some sort of efficiency I can identify there on the on a large a large you know on the large number uh, that you yeah use. so at at Nutra when Nutra sold in 2017 they were about 40 40 million 43 million of EBITDA so we're actually yeah we'll be higher than Nutra was um, you know in a much shorter period of time and one of the things that we've done well we've done a few things different one is that we actually allow partners founders to roll equity. Um, we always take a majority position, but we allow founders to, to, to join us. And that was one of the things that I learned at, at Nutraceutical is we always struggled because generally we buy 100% and the founders would be off and, and doing something else. And they're critical to really helping the brands grow. I mean, they're the visionary. They have passion. So integrate and to grow. There's integration processes, but also growth to keep the, those alignments. I, I totally connect to what you're saying. Yeah. But I want to also, if, if I may, you know, so I'm an Amazon seller listening out there and I have my own brand. Uh, like, what are you guys looking for? How do I know it's just a fit? You know, if I'm, I did well with my brand from zero to a few million, 
I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm close to my edge. I need something that's more resourceful. What are you guys offering? Well, what's your, what's, what's the opportunity for Amazon sellers out there with, uh, with Grove? Take, you know, yeah. take a moment to focus on that. Absolutely. Yeah. So really if, if the brands fit within kind of the categories that we're looking at, we have, we have six verticals. We have dietary supplements, personal care, um, sports, nutrition, pet, food, and household. But again, focused on wellness and, and beauty, um, more natural. If they have brands in, the, in, in, in those categories, they're definitely a candidate. Also, if they're interested in, they wanna continue in the business, um, but they know that they're a point that they need help, um, you know, we can, th they would be a good candidate. I, as brands grow, they realize, look, if I'm gonna really take this to the next level, I'm gonna have to build out a, a pretty significant internal team. I mean, and how do I do things like traditional retail? I have no idea. You know, I, I, I have concerns about regulatory on the manufacturing side. So we can bring all of these resources to help a brand grow. And then the other thing that we offer is those that roll equity is we believe that Grove will be more worth more as a whole than brands will be on their own. And so um, those that roll equity with us, our partners, they get that multiple enhancement um, by being part of us. So on the equity that they roll, they'll get, they, they should get a much higher multiple than they would on, on selling the brand on their own. Plus so just to clarify this. So if I want to sell my brand to, uh, to Grove, yeah. You, will got, you, you guys will pay, you know, there's going to be a liquidity event because, you know, the majority of shares will be sold or all That's the true. shares, but then you'll pay some of it in equity, right? In Grove. So you get a part of Grove, right? A percentage of Grove or a piece of the action of, of the, the corporation, call, call it. And then you can actually stay and integrate and grow with the team with this empire that's building up and enjoy all its resources. So, of course, you can keep growing the brand that you founded. But if you connect to the mission and purpose of these other brands, you find yourself, you know, uh, in, in a very interesting position. Yeah, and it's actually equity in the brand that they have. Um, they would roll equity. So if we buy a brand, let's say brand A, let's say we buy 60%, they would roll 40% equity in that brand. And then together we would grow the, the revenue and the EBITDA. We would bring all of our resources. We're completely aligned in wanting the brand to grow because we both benefit. And then at some point when we sell the brand, we believe that the multiple will be much higher than, than they would get otherwise on selling it on their own. So there's kind of two ways that we help them. Um, you know, we, we have nine partnerships today um, and, you know, people that are interested, they can talk to our existing partners. You know, we really pride ourselves in being a good partner. A lot of our partners, I, I have companies that I bought, I bought their brands at Nutraceutical and they've started other things and they've come back to me now and, and partnered with us at Grow because we try to be really good partners. Um, and that's our best deal flow is, is through references from our partners. And, you know, we want them to be happy and we want them to help us, you know, grow their brands. And so it's important, that's important for us, that partner relationship. Got it, got it, I like that. So uh, just to recap on a little bit on that, there's, you know, the, the, the flagship or the, the corporate company, which is Grove. When you roll up a company, you can obviously buy everything or you buy, let's say, 60%, 40% stays with the brand owner or the, the seller. And then they can grow uh, based because you can apply all the available resources uh, of the corporation, uh, of, of the parent company into the subsidiary. So they can really grow and scale from there um, and, and to maybe a secondary uh, uh, level or tier of an exit because all these resources are applied, everything is compounded, and boom, you, boom, you can really blow it up in the future if needed. You can always... Whereas case you have a brand that lives for hundred years is much pride to take into that as well. We all know Park to Park and Gamble and their brands, they're, 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 uh, they're amazing brands and uh, international brands. And that's a dream of every inventor, every entrepreneur to have a global product that, you know, compels to all the consumers. So that's never a bad thing because don't forget if it's a global brand, everybody's consuming it, you're making money. That's Let's right. not forget it. It's a real business that makes money uh, and profit. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. So uh, David, thank you so much for that. I want to kind of, um, package together what we have so far and, and reach to the second and last part of the episode. So born and raised in Logan in Utah, right? In 1995 until 1997, when you're 18 until you're 20 years old, you actually go on a mission with the Murmur Church. You go to Uruguay, just give from yourself and, and you hone yourself to something that is bigger and more important than you, right? It's a community. Uh, and then 1997, you go back, you return back home. Uh, you go to university. You started, uh, you know, with more on the, I guess, um, uh, the, the, the medical side, and then you convert it into a, uh, the financial side. Uh, and as you graduated, you, you scored your first job in 1999 with um, Anusha uh, Sudokul, right? 
and then you uh, started on the cost accounting side, but then you grew for 20 plus years uh, as, a, as a powerhouse for them, at least uh, uh, with M&A mergers and, and acquisition. Uh, you saw, you know, the whole industry reshaping format, in, at least on the, the wellness and beauty categories. Uh, in 2006, you actually uh, 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 buy a company uh, with, with, you know, the Brian owned, uh, and then Brian shifted off to a doing uh, uh, establishing Grove, and then you stayed in touch for about, uh, you know, 14 years until you joined in 2020. But uh, for the first 12 years, uh, Brian grew up Grove as an innovative company until he saw that you uh, uh, actually saw you and I guess other trends in the industry buying uh, brands uh, that are online brands that sell on Amazon. So he kind of added that into his model. I guess he funded it early on with the success from his uh, 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 business model with being an innovative uh, company for um, for that for those industries and categories. And then um, as you matured with uh, uh, your own company in your own position, and Brian was dripping in, you know, on the back end, telling you to uh, tag along. Finally, in 2020, you made the move uh, right into uh, the pandemic age. And inst instead of that being a bust, it was a huge shift in, in the launching pad for. Uh, for e-commerce in general, and of course for, for Grove inside of it. And um, you guys already established uh, in the past 15 months about, you said seven or eight deals? Yep, eight deals. And you got about nine partnerships going along. So you guys, uh, of course, the category is very important to you. It's very, very clear that lane, wellness and beauty, I guess, needless to say, the, the, the how helpful it is to consumers around the world to, to stay healthy and, and, and well preserved. Um, and as you look for, for, for growing and, and purchasing more of the companies beyond the fact that it has to be in the right category, has to have the right values and the right kind of, uh, uh, you know, it has to be natural. Uh, if it's organic, probably even better, things like that. Uh, the team and whoever you are dealing with has to have, you know, the same mission, purpose and value. So you can really grow together and create unique positions of further success and growth into the future. Uh, and did I get everything correctly so far? That's a good recap. Yeah, that's great. Good All right, enough. very good. All right, so thank you so much for that. I learned a lot, so I appreciate it. Okay, now I want to close the episode with two points. The first point will be is uh, if somebody wants to connect with you and learn more about you, where can they find you? And the last thing will be is what is your message of hope and inspiration for entrepreneurs listening out there? Yeah, so people can reach me at dbunch at grove.com. So email is a great way to reach me. Um, you know, LinkedIn as well. You can message me. Um, our website is grove.com. Yeah, I'd love to hear from people that might be interested in talking. And it could be even for advice. Happy to share whatever whatever I can to, to help people. And uh, your second question, you know, one of the things that we established early on at Grove, you know, as soon as I got here is we have a mantra and we call it create value with values. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways that uh, people can make money. Um, you know, we, we can make money doing a lot of things. And we felt like, it, you know, it's important that we do it in the, in the right way. And, uh, you know, so that we have things like integrity, uh, you know, 100% integrity, you know, that and, you know, how we treat people with respect, you know, doesn't matter what position you are out in Grove. And that includes our partners, you know, we treat people well. And uh, we don't try to take advantage of people. And, and so we've tried to live by that is, you know, if we can take care of the value side, you know, value is going to come along with it. Um, and uh, so that, that's really the mantra we try to live by at Grove. And I think that's important, um, you know, as people think through it, you know, you can make money doing a lot of things, but, but do it in the right way, um, you know, with values. And that, that's really, you know, the advice uh, I'd like to leave. I love that. Very, very unique. Create value with value is beautiful. And it comes from a man that dedicated two years of his life just to give. Uh, and that's very, very, very valuable. Beautiful. Thank you so much, David, once again. I hope everybody enjoyed. Stay, stay safe and healthy. Until next time. Yeah, thank you.